reactions sometimes is depression, of course. And one of the symptoms of depression is suicidal ideation. So often pastoral counselors um, are looking to, to help that person acknowledge the pain, not just physical pain, but psychological pain. And that is often seen psychotherapeutically as what will mitigate the suicidal ideation. You know, we're helping them wrestle with death, which is also often wrestling with God. So um, it seems to me that this new legislation poses huge challenges in a psychotherapeutic relationship where you can sort of short circuit this conversation about wrestling with death. So I just wondered if you had any comments about that. That's such a great question. I'm so glad you asked it because now I'll have clearer thinking about uh, about this area when I'm asked it next time. Um, Yes, a lot of people who come to the end of, I'm a, and I have to say right up front, I'm just speaking from the experience of my organization when I say this and what people have told me, I'm not a clinician. Um, but it is a common part of the end of life to have depression, for example. Um, and we do as an organization want people to have a death that is not necessarily peaceful, but one where they have had a chance to reconcile their emotions and uh, their relationships with other people and their spirituality in a way that they have that inner peace. Uh, we can't, interestingly, through this work, I've learned that our hospice can't guarantee a peaceful death because people think that someone will just go to sleep and peacefully die, but that actually isn't always the case, even with all of modern technology. Um, and those of our, my colleagues who do this work on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it, they're clinicians or in spiritual care or in ethics, will tell me that that whole short-circuiting piece is their biggest anxiety because there's so much that can happen at the end of life in terms of uh, preparing yourself, leaving a legacy if you're, for example, a young parent and you're dying, you know, so there's something to read out to your kids on their 18th birthday, that kind of thing. There's so much that can be done um, to help a person come to terms with who they are and what the meaning of their life is and uh, also to you know, resolve differences or make peace with family members and people that they love. And it really goes to what Christine was saying earlier about the importance of having that support. It doesn't have to be in, a, certainly probably not best in a hospital, but sometimes it is there. Um, I One of the first things that we did when the legislation came out was to bring in some of our internal experts in palliative care, spiritual care, uh, from hospice, from hospital, from other settings. Um, we ask the question, do we do good end of life care in that holistic sense so that we, we that short circuit doesn't happen. Whatever the way the person dies, that short circuit is, doesn't take away their chance to have some inner peace. And at our hospice, yes, we do do that work and we have hospice outreach for 3000 people every year too. So we're really doing some great work there. In hospital, hospital care is so choppy now, people are on 12 hour shifts, so they cycle through quickly if they're staff members. We like to get you out if you come in, if you've been into hospital, you probably know how quickly we want to get you out. That's not an environment in which you can build those relationships to play a role in preventing that short circuit from happening. So I think that you've hit on a really crucial issue and uh, we have a lot of work to do in Canada, to Christine's point, to create a better environment for that, for that, um, I don't know what the opposite of short circuit is now, but for holistic kind of discussion and care to take place. It is a great question, and it's certainly one that I often feel woefully unprepared to do long-term work with. Um, so, I mean, I guess that says something about theological education and pastoral studies and that kind of stuff, and we're always, every General Assembly, we're loading another course or another department on all of our seminaries, so I don't want to go there. Um, but the average minister, does not have enough skill 
reading background to really walk people through that conversation in a, in, in a really helpful way long term. So I think one of the key things, and I know um, when I have the opportunity to talk with young ministers, um, and most of them are going into small towns, the ones that talk to me anyway, <laughs> um, I say one of the biggest things you need to do is to build a support network. So you need to get to know your hospital, you need to get to know what the chaplaincy is like there, you need to get to know is there a palliative care wing in your hospital and who looks after that. You need to know who some of the counselors are in your area, you need to be in touch with paramedics and police officers and physicians that uh, service your area and develop a relationship with them so that you can say, you know, I, I will walk with you and pray with you and, you know, um, and read scripture with you and, you know, share with you things that I find might find helpful to read. But here's a name and a number and I will contact that person on your behalf right now and at least, you know, introduce you. So, that, I mean, I did that last night on the phone actually driving from a session meeting, I'm interim moderator at a church in Sarnia and drove to Cambridge, so I was at least halfway to Toronto um, and was setting up with the Alzheimer's Society in Lambton County um, a name and a call for this family for her to have access with that person dealing with that on the phone while I was driving here, hands-free, in case you're going to have me <laughs> arrested. Um, but, but that, I think, in some ways, the average parish pastor you really need to identify how many resources are out there and get to know those things and have those resources at your fingertips so that you're able to refer people on because there's no way that we're going to be able to be experts um, in everything. Um, parish pastors like myself are the last remaining GPs of the clerical world. So um, everybody wants to specialize, you know, so, um, but there are still people that need a GP, right? And, and need one in their area. So, and I also think one of the biggest skills that we probably could work on just as Christians, but particularly as leaders, is to learn how to listen. And to listen to understand, not listen to reply, or not listen to give advice but to listen to understand, because I find a lot of people, especially in the depth of pain and anguish, they really want somebody that just is gonna listen to them and love them. They often know there's no simple answer to all this, but someone who will actually just sit and listen to them and isn't busy rushing down the hall to see somebody else or you know, heading off to an appointment and has an ongoing relationship can be a valuable person. And never underestimate the uh, the value just of pastoral presence. Thanksgiving Sunday morning, I was called to the hospital for a guy I've known for 20 years who just turned 60. And um, he ended up dying that morning, um, but the family uh, called me in. And, um, you know, to just have the opportunity to be there with that family. They're all Catholic, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but. That was my relationship. I had known them for a long time. So a lot of it was just not so much, I think, what I said, but just the fact that at 7 o'clock in the morning, the faster pastor jumped in her car and rushed to the hospital and, and was there with them and held their hands and hugged them and, and offered uh, a prayer, you know, um, that that often is our presence counts. <laughs> so. I, I just want to make two comments. Uh, I think John and Christine have really responded in, in rich ways to this question, and I don't know that I have a lot to, to add to that. Um, but I, I want to say one thing from a programmatic perspective in theological education and the future, and that is, uh, and, and, and I think the life of the church, I think we, we, as some of you know, we've started here at Knox, a uh, new Master of Pastoral Studies program, which is a two-year program of which the main track is spiritual care and psychotherapy. And so some students will do this as part of their MDiv or in addition to their MDiv to get that specialized training for pastoral work. But we also imagine a cohort of people who will be professional spiritual care uh, uh, and psychotherapists uh, and registered with the College of uh, uh, 
Psychotherapists of Ontario, so that I think increasingly the church and the churches are recognizing that this in and of itself is a ministry in our culture, given the reality of mental health issues. Um, so that's one thing. Glenn already knew that because he's involved in uh, helping to mentor in that program, but for the rest of you, I wanted to just mention that. Um, from uh, the, the only other thing I wanted to add is is just to affirm, I think, Glenn, what you're saying is I've only come to realize in the last few years in a much more profound way than I ever did when I was a pastor of how uh, significant mental health issues are around death issues. Um, and I think, you know, you identify the person who's facing death. There's also the families uh, of those who are facing death as well. Um, and just two specific incidents. Um, my grandmother lived uh, till uh, she was almost 107. Um, she died just uh, five years ago. Um, so I, I always used to tell Kit kid my kids that uh, I was going to have my midlife crisis when I turned about 55, so just to keep up with her. But um, she lived a long, long life, a long, long life of faith. But the last few years were really miserable. And the reason they were miserable fundamentally was because I had a 33-year-old cousin with three young children who died of cancer very quickly, about seven weeks from diagnosis to death. And for my grandmother, this was just unacceptable. And so for her, having lived a whole life of faith, now to have to deal with the reality of why God would do this or permit this or allow this or whatever language you want to do, it just all seems so unfair and unjust. So she got really angry, and then she went into a deep depression from which she really never came out. She sort of died in that toward the end. Uh, and so it made me realize how powerful you know, those responses and those emotions are. Um, and I saw it with my own mother as well, although over a shorter period of time, and, um, and then seeing how it's impacted my father around issues just of anxiety and grief and working through that. So I think we have to, to name all of that in terms of, uh, and, and I think from the perspective of the church and the Christian community, we have something to offer because we're, uh, coming at this uh, not just from a, a psychotherapeutic perspective, but also from a spiritual care perspective. And, and I think, uh, given what's going on in the culture, it seems to me this is a huge opportunity for ministry, um, and not just an opportunity, but a, a call, a call for the church. In our discussion, we have alluded <clears throat> to other professionals in the community whom all this impacts. And uh, I wonder if we just take a few moments to maybe name a few others, because we're talking now about <clears throat> being the GP for <laughs> the parish, I think, as Christine is pointing out. But I'm, I'm aware, for example, of pharmacists who, uh, perhaps in small communities, who have uh, tension around this issue, who uh, may have a sense that I'm not even going to carry these drugs, uh, that kind of thing, or uh, wrestling with that. Uh, we have mentioned nurse practitioners. Uh, there are others who do pastoral visiting in the hospital from our congregations and uh, who need not, as John Woods, I think, mentioned, freeze. How do we work with them so that they can, as Christine says, listen? And um, I don't know whether there are other, uh, I think Christine also mentioned the funeral director who struggles with this as well. And as pastors, we need to be uh, alert to engaging in conversation, offering support, uh, having conversations with these people so that they can share um, some of the turmoil that they, they themselves may be experiencing. And I don't know whether there are others that we can mention in our communities that we should be alert to. I was hoping you'd say something. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's uh, yeah, so you know, I work with folks who are struggling with this, but I think going to, you know, your comment, your, I loved your sort of structure about how we think about death in our Christian faith 
um, around it. It's the enemy, or is it a natural process, or is it the friend? And of course, a lot of health in a lot of healthcare, it's the enemy, and you you kind of want a doc or a nurse practitioner to see it as the enemy of if you come into an emergency department after a road traffic accident. But as you probably all know, um, one of the you know our if you like a cultural weakness in our society about being able to talk openly about death that's not a taboo subject, that is very, very present amongst uh, clinicians, pharmacists uh, of all kinds. And we've had situations in which it's been perceived that somebody wants, for example, medical assistance in dying, but when we've delved into it, it's just because the specialist who first spoke to them um, spoke in so many euphemisms that the patient resident didn't even understand what, what they were being asked because uh, no one had directly asked them the question, you know, do you want your life to be ended by medical assistance in dying? So it's challenging for people to talk about death, which is where I think you all play such a huge role. If you can be a presence, um, people don't often ask for spiritual care, unfortunately, in our hospitals these days, even in a Catholic hospital. But if you're able to be there as a presence, if you're able to come in from the community as to be a person there who can, who can have the conversation about death, who can bring clinicians in in a different way, um, that's an incredibly valuable contribution you could make in the work that I and my colleagues do, for example, as well as uh, supporting the people that you serve and that we jointly serve sometimes. In terms of the, the question you asked there about professionals as conscientious objectors, um, I think the colleges have given pretty good guidance on how to handle it from a technical perspective. Like, you, you just need to map out who it is you're going to talk to if the situation arises where you can no longer continue to provide a service so that someone else can take that on and make sure the person, if you're a if you were a physician, for example, make sure the person continues to get great care uh, until somebody else is able to come in and take over that care. And for a pharmacist, it's a little bit different maybe, but in a sense, it's not that dissimilar. You just need to make sure you have your roadmap so that you can as efficiently as possible make sure that the care is passed on to somebody who will respect that particular wish of the person. And we can't unravel it any more than that because if only one in 50 people follow through with the procedure and 49 others just want to talk about it uh, and ultimately decide that they're not going to take it, well, it's going to be a part of our everyday lives as if we're conscientious objectors as well. That's just something we'll have to deal with. And it's a personal decision about how far you go before you decide that this is a firm request for medical assistance in dying. That's the tricky thing for individual people. And we have found that it is, in our case, our ethicist, but it could have been someone from spiritual care, someone who's not uncomfortable talking about death, or at least is willing to do it even if they are uncomfortable, who help conscientious objectors find where that place is for them, help them resolve where their moral distress lies, how to balance the moral distress of abandoning potentially a person they serve versus participating in something that they believe is morally wrong. So it, I think it all goes back to this cultural piece. And in hospitals where, in hospitals in particular, where we see death as the enemy, there's probably more work to do there than most places. I don't know if that was helpful, but. In terms of other professionals, and again, just from small town experience, um, particularly if, if MAID was to happen at a home setting, officers could be involved, um, paramedics, who are usually there to try to see death as the enemy, right? And, uh, you know, I mean, these are people that, um, again, some of whom I have in congregation, or at least know, so that there's issues for them. I can also think as well of um, other professionals like teachers, for example, you know, who have a parent or a grandparent of a child or another relative, um, and then that child comes to school and starts talking about that and how does a teacher handle that when that topic is is raised in the classroom, you know? so. Yeah. The only thing I want to add is I've noticed in the last few years dealing with medical professionals, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, etc., uh, a change in professional attitude that, that I take to be a good thing. 
that is a, a willingness and an openness for some conversation and a willingness and an openness to discuss issues not from the perspective of I'm the professional and I know better than you but there's a willingness to, to have some conversation um, about some of these things so I, I think that that is a is a is a good thing I I noticed in uh, last year um, when my mother uh, died working with two physicians around this um, that that they were quite uh, they admitted where their struggles were on some of these issues and what some of the some of the you know some of the questions are so I think that's a good sign in terms of that so we shouldn't feel I, I think often people still certainly my my parents generation felt you just don't question what a professional medical person says right so uh, or enter in a conversation and I think that's changing and I hope that's a reflection of what's going on in our medical schools etc but I, I suspect it is First, I want to thank uh, John and all the Johns um, <laughs> and the college and Christine, and particularly for adding such a passionate, connected process to community pastoral care, uh, the need to involve other professionals. Uh, I do some part-time work in one of the hospital systems as a chaplain, and what's interesting to me um, in getting my feet wet in that uh, I've seen palliative cases where the treatment program is really to, again, pain uh, and, and adjust to the palliative. But, they all, but physicians and medical personnel also struggle with what is this individual's choice? How do we deal with that? And medical care is incredibly complex. Um, so we might take a long time to look at theological values and the principles and come up with an answer. But for a lot of practitioners, these decisions have to be made within an hour <laughs> or, or within a couple of days. But I've also seen patients, uh, and not always of the Christian faith, um, who are in a palliative program but decided at some point and, and accepting that treatment and then at other times have decided to change their mind for the sake of their family and their faith um, to fight. No, I'm, I, I know I'm palliative, but I'm going to deny that I'm palliative. Uh, and I want to fight. I want to live. I want to give an example of fighting to my children and to my family. So it, it's sometimes it's remarkable to witness that, but I've also witnessed the incredible complexity on, let's say, a cardiac ward, where in our wonderful care that if politicians could spend a day in the hospital system, our results in medical financing might be different, um, where you have um, a, doctors and nurses looking at the discharge planning of, you know, we've got all the patients on this ward, we've got a 35 bed emergency department with 42 patients in it this morning, who can we discharge to move to another hospital? Who's well enough that, and what treatment can we discharge to move to another hospital system where they can still be cared for within our system because we know we're gonna have this coming up. So doctors are doing not only just medical care, but organizational restructuring within the management of finances. And I, I liked your point of, as churches, how do we involve other practitioners? We don't want to make ministers social workers, but on the other hand, if we're not connecting with CCAC and the community resources, how do we give that practical value to our to our parish and their care? And I come at it with this, I want to close just with sort of the following closing question. I know, I know um, in some ways from a caregiver response, and terminate. It can feel like life interrupted. You know, you've got your life and your family over here and long distance travel and dealing. How do we care for uh, family members? It interrupts our life. And yet, sometimes what we're doing is death interrupted. <laughs> how do we give value and good quality of life for uh, our family members so that they can feel that this is life? 
that they have and that they're not a burden. <laughs> That's okay. In the con sorry, PSWs in the context of this, because at least in my area, um, per personal support workers um, are dispatched from CCAC or VON or some other Victorian or nurses certainly to go into homes for people who are palliative or nearing the end of their life. And I think, well, I think a lot of things. One, um, PSWs are generally horribly paid for what they do. We also have um, one of our technical high schools in, well, the only one in, in Sarnia. Uh, I mean, we have students graduating out of grade 12 with a PSW certificate who I don't think are anywhere near prepared to go in. They're 18 years old. Um, I don't think I was prepared for very much at 18, although I thought I was, um, to go in and to deal with these hard things. I've had PSWs say, you know, when someone was on a morphine pump, you know, that um, some of the hard things that they've had to, to deal with when the patient is in pain but is physically too weak to push that pump. <laughs> You know, and I had a PSW say, I just put my hand over theirs <laughs> so that they technically are the ones that are pushing, giving themselves another dose of morphine because technically I'm not allowed to do that. Um, so, I mean, that's a, so the whole area of PSWs, I think, and how they're educated, um, the supports that are there and the maturity <laughs> and, and help that's there for PSWs, um, because again, as you said, more and more people, hospitals want to move people out, right? And get them home right? you know, um, and stuff. But that does create an extra burden on families. And then we ask PSWs to come in to help. And I mean, PSW care can be A, difficult to get, B, difficult to keep on getting um, because hours are limited, resources are limited, finances are limited. Um, in areas of Canada, uh, certainly there are limits in the number of PSWs that are available um, to come in. So another whole, there we go, another whole layer to the conversation. I thought I'd make a comment just to acknowledge that healthcare is really transactional these days. You, someone comes in, does their bit of the process. If they're a specialist, someone else comes in and does their bit. They hand you off from the hospital to a nursing home or to a home care provider. In the community, you may have one organization come in and do nursing, another come in and do physio, et cetera. And in a way, based on this discussion, if relationships are what life is all about, you can see in that model, we're not really creating the opportunities for professionals, uh, PSWs even in many cases too, to have those relationships within which those end of life discussions can flourish. Whereas uh, without those relationships, they don't flourish very well. I'll never forget one during our early discussions at St. Joe's, our head of the service of palliative care said, I often have my conversations with people in the elevator as they're leaving the hospital, because that's how late in the process someone connects palliative care into the care of that person. And then of course, when they leave the hospital, it's somebody else that they'll be looking for to find uh, support. You won't be surprised by that if you have encountered the healthcare system, you know it can be like that. Uh, so again, a, a role I think for folks like you to play in helping to provide uh, some of those relationships. One of the, our greatest concerns is that projections in Ontario suggest that there'll be an increasing proportion of people who haven't had children and therefore are more isolated in old age, and that's going to be a growing part of our society. So somehow we need to find a way to give those people relationships, however they show up, and especially if they're more vulnerable and lonely and isolated in our communities. Healthcare isn't going to fix that problem. Uh, I don't want to change. This may be related to what we're talking about. My question goes in a different direction. Thank you, so kind of you. 
And uh, I feel the made M A I D is a carefully crafted acronym to replace our servanthood as a Christian community. And uh, when Chris mentioned about uh, the lack of palliative care in rural area, and I think in rural area in Canada, one thing that is not short is love and compassion, I believe, in that community, tightly knit community. And they just feed them, and change their diapers, and with the modern technology to sedate people, whether it's a people like have a pancreatic cancer or lymphoma, just sedate them and give them food until God take, takes their life. I think Catholics have done something right. One thing that shows in the statistics, the number keeps going up. They even have a shepherd's fund entitled to care for those people who have cared for us. Like in my formative years, as I was a communist in China, but here at the Knox Presbyterian Church, those people feed me, treat me like their children. And as a Christian, as a pastor, my job is to feed them, to close them, to change their diapers, to take them to the hospital. It should not be hard. If there's opportunity, I would do it. You know, if I'm caught, I would do it. So we really cannot let made to change our servanthood we are called to be. Thank you. I just had a really quick comment on a positive note. Um, there, there is a lot of uh, literature emerging from the hospice movement, which is fairly new. Uh, and uh, especially nurses talking about this journey toward the end of life and the deep psychological and especially spiritual aspect of this. This is appearing now in scientific literature in a way it never has before because of hospices. So that's something we can really tap into with this, I think. Yeah. Actually, one of my co-workers' husbands here, and I just found out, <laughs> Glenn. Um, I work where we deal with Native people who connecting with, where we have Natives who who want suicide because they're so sick, and 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 how do I, you know, how do I, as an organization, when we have 20 staff who are so many people and a different faith, how do we? accept that and deal with that like that's to me a, me a, more for me a challenge like i remember a friend who, who within a year tried suicide and and we rallied to bring him back to health and 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 part of it is like why i mean this man is so like he his health is so bad why are we judging and saying you know here we're going to care for you like the system is not there for many of our community natives who live on the street. They don't have a home to say, let's find a place. I, I thank you for that. I think that's a very helpful question and raises a number of issues um, that we, we haven't really touched on. I mean, you're raising specifically an issue that really, again, connects us to where we were yesterday afternoon and issues around this in terms of uh, indigenous peoples and the experiences that that they bring to this and the needs that they bring and the lack of access to services you know that many of them uh, experience um, in their communities um, i was thinking uh, as well related to that what we haven't touched on is i mean my job this morning was to talk a little bit about 
this issue from the perspective of a Christian theological perspective, but part of that surely also has to be to think from the perspective of a theological position that the church might have in relation to the other religious traditions in Canada. I mean, we've touched ecumenically, but um, and their views of death, and uh, that's increasingly going to be a huge, well, not going to be, it is a huge, a huge issue. My wife, Lynn, worked for about a decade as what was called a spiritual animator in Quebec with the public school board uh, on the West Island. Animator doesn't translate very well. People used to think she drew cartoons, but um, it's, it's the French word animateur, which is better translated probably as facilitator. And for all intents and purposes, she was a, a chaplain or a spiritual care worker. And a lot of her work was around grief issues. And a lot of her work was with indigenous peoples and people of other cultures, translating and interpreting their cultural expectations and understandings to the school system and then interpreting the policies and procedures of the school system back to them around issues of, of death and, and dying. And so she worked with children often who were uh, who had parents who were in, in palliative care situations. Um, so um, I say all of that simply to say there's another whole dimension here that uh, I think you've touched on nicely and that also raises other questions about uh, our views of death and the culture. I think we've been sort of assuming a certain still, um, you know, Christian perspective as we should this morning theologically, but there are, there, there are other views uh, that will come into this as well. Christine, I just wanted to go back to you and the Church Doctrine Committee just for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, you gave us a lot of information about the subcommittee. What exactly did the Church ask you to do, ask the Church Doctrine Committee to do? <laughs> Write a report. Um, <laughs> What else does church doctrine get asked to do? Um, yes, yeah, so we've been asked to write a report in light of this new legislation in the nation on a faithful response and guide for Presbyterians in light of this, this legislation. So it's both doctrine and practice. Yes. Good doctrine, it is always practice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Christine, I think you have been signed to a very important job that's going to affect many, many people and for many generations to come. If uh, your report goes well and will continue to die as a Presbyterian, if not, I will die as a Catholic. As long as you die in Christ. <laughs> the label doesn't mean a whole lot. So. so you have a very important job on your hands. Yeah, if, 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 it's, if it's not facetious, uh, I mean, I think... Uh, Thank you. Seeking the prayers of the church for the Church Doctrine Committee is a good thing to ask. I think you might be aware that we're carrying a very, very heavy load right now. And uh, there are many, many issues. Um, and there's a, a lot of things that are affecting the entire denomination and the future of the denomination. So I think that this is a very uh, critical time in, in the life of the church. So. Um, we are, as I said, we are going to do our best. We are, are rebelling in that we are not coming in with a full-fledged report for 2017 because I think that's an unreasonable thing to be asked to do, and the rest of the committee agrees. Um, and we, if we're going to do something, we would like to do it well. And in the meantime, we will offer an interim report and resources and encourage congregations to have these conversations. So I think that's probably another thing is that I think it's important both in a multicultural nation in which we live and even in, I mean, small towns are not homogeneous. Um, there are vestiges of Christendom, but there's a smattering of everything. Um, I think it is really important that as Christian people, regardless of the Presbyterian label or not, but as Christian people that we have these conversations. Um, you know, my own church, we had, a, we had this kind of a conversation just a, a couple of weeks ago 
with someone who works in palliative care to talk about not only palliative care, but also what are some of the things you need to be thinking about now and what are some of the things you need to be talking with your family about so that everybody is it, it can talk about this and is aware of things so that you, if you are in a position where there's a cardiac situation and a decision needs to be made, that your family is very aware of what your wishes are and then, and then can proceed knowing that that can all change. Right? I mean, it can. So, and family members out of the a desire to love and respect their loved ones sometimes go against the wishes that their loved one has stated, but they're unable to articulate at that particular moment and they're not ready to let mom go or let dad go. And so, you know, but we need to have that conversation. And I think as John was trying to say in parts of his uh, presentation, to, to remember who we are and what it is that we believe and that, you know, we do have something to offer uh, people in a culture, some of whom I think are in d despair and real um, discouragement over life and what the meaning of life is and is there life after death and is there meaning in suffering. I mean, that is one of the areas that the Christian faith has something particular to offer is the whole area of because of Christ and the cross um, and Christ's concern and compassion for those who are suffering. We have something to say about meaning and suffering. I recognize we're coming to a uh, conclusion today, and uh, I've asked uh, Bob Smith, if you would, to come up and say thanks. Uh, just have a comment as you're coming up. I noticed Christine talked, uh, keep coming, Bob. <laughs> uh, I noticed Christine gave us some pastoral situations, and I remember how frequently she was called on Sunday morning to go to the hospital. <laughs> She's got a service to do. Uh, which is why you don't leave your sermon writing to the right to the end. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you are going to fly to assembly and you had to do something else yeah. of a pastoral nature. Mm -hmm. And there was a third one. I can't remember it right off the top. Thanks, you. No, I didn't mention well, or, or rushing to my brother, yes, and yes. having a, a yes, thanks, caring congregation that allows me to be with him for a month or so at a time. Mm -hmm. so. And a lot of this, of course, comes with the responsibility of long-term pastor. And so I, I'd like to underscore that as well. <clears throat> um, as you perform faithfully your ministry in a community, you get to be known, even in a small town, and ever-increasing circles, and get called upon to perform very important ministries. And... Uh, I'm just making a comment there about this and, and hoping our theologians remember that. And so I've asked Robert to uh, say thanks. Uh, John and John and Christine, on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us your, your expertise and your experience, but also the way in which you've done that so sensitively and so personally. Uh, Thank you so much. I think it's been a blessing to be part of this conversation and you've opened up all sorts of issues and questions for us that I'm sure will enrich us as we go on and continue in whatever way we do uh, with dealing with people in these situations. So thank you so much from all of us. And we'll bid adieu to our YouTube audience. Uh, I understand we had a few technical issues and we apologize for that. Uh, those of you in the room are aware we have been served lunch, so let us uh, have a word of grace before we proceed. Gracious God, we thank you for the richness of this time together as we have reflected upon the issues surrounding MAID and as it impacts upon our ministries, our connections with people from the communities in which we come. And we ask your blessing upon us as we return, uh, our blessings upon, your blessings upon those who've joined us from uh, distances. Grant that we may be able to exercise a more faithful, profound ministry to those who are in need. And now we ask your blessing upon the food that has been prepared for us. And grant that it may strengthen us and feed us, nourish us, to be the people you have called us to be. For these things we ask in Christ's name and for his sake. 
Amen.